Davis. I am the farm manager here at the Food Project um, in Wenham. Been farming for close to a decade now, and me being able to, uh, yeah, just connect with the soil and, and with the earth is really what's kept me going um, with agriculture. Agroecology is a design system, right? It's like a design system of how you're setting up your ecosystem of your farm. So I think the big difference for me in contrast to some of the other design systems that people might use when, when they talk about like permaculture or like regenerative agriculture or even organic agriculture, right? Um, those are very like technical based things um, where agroecology is also like social and political movement in order to make change at like a global level. A lot of the knowledge of like our ancestors that they've had doing this work long before there were books or um, teachers, right? Um, who are like talking about these things and, and just doing it. And so for me, honoring that history and those like knowledge systems of things like the Three Sisters. And so agroecology, I think to me is like the combination of like honoring those practices while continuing to like innovate and trial new things, um, which often happens at the farm level with the farmers being like, well, maybe this, um, maybe this will work here. The thing with, you know, with agroecology, it tends to be two things it tends to be more um, knowledge intensive and it tends to be more labor intensive and so because um, understanding yeah larger ecosystems we're not just focusing on one bed or one row but kind of the whole farm at the farm level as a whole ecosystem which means yeah planting flowers so buckwheat would be considered a cover crop for us um, and then the zinnias and marigolds, um, scabiosa, bachelor's button, all these different flowers that we're planting, um, mostly for pest regulation. Will eventually be encased by, by buckwheat on all sides. And so buckwheat, because it grows so quickly and early, it's some of the first flowering things on our fields, um, which will then invite parasitic wasps, beneficial insects, early enough um, before we pass a threshold of pest damage on some of our crops. And parasitic wasps, there's a, a lot of different kinds out there. Um, but for us, um, we're looking, there's ones that specifically are targeting um, more exoskeleton pests. Um, so when you think of like beetles or things like that, um, and what the parasitic wasp does is it'll come in and it'll lay eggs inside of the pest, right? And then the pest, um, the eggs then emerge out of the pest. And so it basically mummifies the pest and then will emerge out, basically paralyzing that pest in its tracks. And so um, they tend to like smaller flowers. And so the buckwheat is really good for that because it's a bunch of little small flowers and white flowers. Um, and so they'll tend to find hosts in the buckwheat, which will then kind of attack the field um, for those pests that are out there. In addition to the buckwheat on the edges, every eight to 10 rows in this field, um, we have a strip of flowers, whether that's marigolds or zinnias, um, for many reasons. Um, one is just beauty and aesthetics, right? We love looking at flowers. They bring us joy um, if we're weeding for four hours in a hot day. So as the buckwheat kind of starts to finish up and starts to reseed itself, the marigolds and the zinnias are starting to flower to offer more, um, yeah, flower space for pollinators and beneficial insects to, um, yeah, have space, will, which will then help pest regulation um, so that we don't, you know, spray any pesticides, um, which we haven't had to at all here. For us, soil health all starts with organic matter. Um, and so building up organic matter, which takes a long time. And especially for us, as we have sandier soil, means lower organic matter. Um, and to improve its soil structure um, is very difficult. It's very hard to, to change your soil structure from like sand to clay, for example. It's almost impossible. But you can make it a little loamier. Um, you can improve it by doing some of the things we do, like cover cropping, composting, 
um, incorporating that organic matter into the soil. Microbial activity can help with reducing um, soil disease. They can help bring uh, more nutrients up from the soil. So you'll tend to have either more of a bacteria dominated or a fungal dominated um, soil. And that will range depending on your carbon and nitrogen ratio in your soil. So keeping aggreg soil aggregates in, in their structure in place, I think that's a big part of it. That's a lot of the microbial, the fungal communities. Um, instead of disrupting that, they can keep them intact. Um, reducing like carbon offsets can help with water infiltration, um, reducing erosion. There's a lot of benefits, but it also depends on your context. Um, and so like what your soil type is, your geography, your climate, your topography, a lot of that will play into if it makes sense um, to do reduced tillage or no-till. Soil testing is a big part of what we do here and how we're analyzing um, the results. Nitrogen seems to be the most focused one, um, but for me the one I look for the most is calcium um, because calcium, calcium is the building block of cell walls and so without calcium your plants aren't even going to grow. Food system a lot, um, but when we're thinking about agroecology, it's kind of the whole agricultural system, which includes fiber, um, which includes yeah dyes and, and flowers and other crops that aren't necessarily food, um, but like the clothes we wear, right, on our skin, largest organ, um, and cotton being one of the most heavily pesticide crops. Um, so being able to yeah grow organic cotton, um, see what that process is, is like, um, and kind of connect it to agricultural system as a whole and not just the food system. Agroecology is about cooperation. It's about farmer to farmer knowledge exchanges. Uh, with agroecology, a lot of it is based on experience. It's on trial and error. And so when farmers are trialing that stuff, um, they're able to share that knowledge and exchange it. For an agroecological system, animals are really important integration um, for long-term soil health management, um, just like the larger ecosystem at large, is animal integration is, is crucial, especially small ruminants. So we're in, in, like introducing sheep this year onto the farm. Yeah, some rotational grazing of sheep coming in, being maybe in, in like this acre for two weeks and then being able to move to another part of the farm. It'll help for multiple purposes of, one is adding manure to the soil, right, of, um, helping to keep um, any weeds and, and other um, unwanted plants kind of down, which also means we, ha we can do less mowing. It's like when I'm planning to plant an orchard on the farm, I might not be here to reap that fruit, right? Um, but I know it'll, it'll feed people for generations and generations to come. So it's not about kind of being able to instantly receive, but to, take care of the land and to give the land what it needs um, for generations to come and not just for now. And so, and that's also part of the soil health. Um, that's part of the human health, the plant health, um, you know, the bird and insect health, right? Everything happening below the soil and above the soil. So using agroecology as a tool to kind of transform that at the hyper local level with this one bed here um, to kind of the policy level, um, locally, state level, nationally, and globally. It gets talked about as like a science practice movement. Um, and that's, yeah, I really believe that's what it is. And that's the change we need to move towards of kind of scaling out agroecology, not, not so much scaling up. taking, 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 um, and we're trying to also give. And so in addition to, um, you know, giving compost and cover crops to the land and like all that we harvest from the land, we're also making offerings back to the land, which for us and for me is also a big part of soil health, right? Because we're off having the reverence for the land and giving offerings of like the first watermelon, the first harvest of kale, the first strawberries that come. So all of these things that the land provides and the soil provides for us, um, wanting to give that back before we're taking everything.
Thank <laughs> you.